Hello, welcome to a new chapter of exercises. Here you have the relativistic action for a free particle in one plus one dimensions. This means that we have time and x position. So we're asked to find the transformations that leave this action invariant. So let's suppose that the variation in time is proportional to an epsilon times a certain function of time and position. And suppose that the variation in position will also be an epsilon times another function, which also depends on position and time, g. So according to the definition of the x dot variation, we will have, if we factor out epsilon, we will have g dot minus x dot f dot. Let's copy this information here. So we know that in order to have the possibility of a symmetry, we need to check the symmetry test condition. So if we calculate this derivative, as there is no dependence on x in the action, it gives zero. This derivative is minus mc squared, times the square root times the derivative of the inside of the root. Therefore, we can cancel this minus with this minus, this two with this two, and this c square with this square. And we have finally m x dot over the square root. The derivative of L with respect to time is zero. So substituting, we see that this is not going to survive and that uh, neither. So the final result is variation of x dot plus L, but L is again this minus mc squared square root of blah 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 times the time derivative of the variation of time plus dt delta g equals zero. So this derivative is epsilon times f dot. So let's replace it. Let's replace this expression as well. We'll replace this with what we have found here. Let's define delta g as a epsilon times a certain function called g as a function of g of x, of course. In this way, we can assure that delta g is a infinitesimal variation. Let's divide the whole equation by epsilon. Let's move up the time derivative of g to the other side. Now it's time to see what g dot is. We know we know that g depends on time and x, partial g with respect to x times x dot plus the time derivative of g. This is equal to gx x dot plus gt. And the same thing for f dot as a function of g and x equals fx times x dot plus ft. So let's save this in this corner and substitute here. So here the problem is usually that we have no idea what g is. And since in many cases g can be zero, I think the smartest thing to do is to try first if g equals zero and see if we are in luck. If this doesn't work, we'll be forced to find a way to compute g. This is a difficult problem because there is no recipe to find these kind of things. It depends a lot on the action in which we are working. So let's set that g equals zero and let's see where this takes us. Now 
we are able to multiply the whole equation by this square root. Let's divide the whole equation by m and let's multiply c squared by the parentheses. Let's expand the left hand side of the equation. Okay, and we can see that this term is cancelled out with this other term. And this with this, and that's it. The surviving terms are these. Let's factor out x dot. And remember that this differential equation has to be valid for any position and any time. That implies that gx must be zero, all this must be zero also, and ft equals zero. We conclude that g is a function only of time, here that f is only a, a function of x, and the remaining term is g prime of t minus c squared f prime of x equals zero. And this is the question that we have to solve. Let's move up the term to the right. The left hand side only depends on t and the right hand side only depends on x. So the only one solution that fulfills this equation for all x and t, the only way you can do this is if g prime and c square f prime are equal to a constant, the same constant a. a is a constant. So we have g prime of t equals a and f prime of x equals a over c square. So g of t equals a t plus a constant b and f of x equals a over c square x plus t. And there's no need to find g. And yes, we are in luck. So looking at these variations, we can see that variation of t equals epsilon times f, but f is a over c square x plus t and the variation of x equals epsilon g and g is a g plus b. We have three constants, a, b, and d. So indeed, we have three transformations. One transformation for each variable. So if we organize variation of t and variation of x like a vector, in fact is a four vector because the whole space time is four dimensional as you know, but in this case we have two components of the variation delta t and delta x and this is equal to a epsilon 1 over c square x and t plus b epsilon 0 and 1 plus d epsilon 1 and 0. We can redefine epsilon because if you have a constant times uh, an infinitesimal number, the final result is another infinitesimal number, which we can call, for instance, epsilon 1. And the same thing is valid for the other constants. This transformation is the well-known time translation. And this is the special translation. And this is a boost, x boost. 
And this is an inertial reference frame change, as you know, if you have studied special relativity. So what are the conserved quantities associated to these transformations? Regarding time translation, if you remember what Santi did in class, he demonstrated that this is the expression that remains constant along the trajectory of the particle. But this is zero. In this case, delta x is zero because we are working with a time translation. So the conserved magnitude is this. The variation of t is one. And this is the energy as it should be, of course. Okay, let's see a special translation. We can copy the same expression here. In the special translation, delta t is zero and delta x is one. So the conserved quantity is the momentum, the linear momentum, the derivative of L with respect to x dot. Good. Let's move up. Let's work with x boost. We see that the variation of x is t. This is one over c squared x. So we have p t minus the Hamiltonian times x over c squared equals constant. But in this case, the Hamiltonian is the same as the energy of the system, as you saw with Santi. Let's multiply the whole equation by C, and then we have PCT minus E divided by C times X equals constant. But this is the same as X0 minus P0 X using the relativistic notation, of course. But this is P1 because it's the momentum in the x direction. But it turns out that this is called M01 equals X0 pi 1 minus X1 P0. And it is part of what is called relativistic angular momentum which is the generalization of the three-dimensional angular momentum, and it's defined in general by m mu nu equals x mu p nu x nu p mu. If we were working with one plus three dimensions, the result would be the complete tensor, m mu nu, that this would be a constant. Good. The question now is how can I construct the complete transformation, namely for a finite parameter instead of an infinitesimal one, which is epsilon. For instance, in this case, it's simple because it consists of adding a constant to the time, t0. While in this case, it's the same thing, but x0 instead of t. But what happens with this uh, transformation? Well, as you probably know, this will give us Lorentz transformations. So let's see. Well, using the relativistic notation, you know that x0 equals ct and x1 equals x. Well, delta t equals epsilon. 1 over c squared x. But if we multiply the whole equation by c, then we will have c delta t equals epsilon x over c. And this is the same as ct, delta ct equals epsilon x over c. But ct is x0, so delta x x0 equals epsilon x over c. And if, if we look at this relation, delta x equals epsilon t, but 
if you multiply and divide by c, then x0 appears. Let's redefine epsilon over c as a epsilon for the same reason as before. Ah, by the way, there is a one here. Let's return to the initial notation, the vector notation. Epsilon x1 and x0. Or you can also think about it in this way, as a matrix multiplying x0, x1. In this way, it becomes obvious that it is a linear transformation that acts on the initial vector to return a final vector after the transformation. But remember that delta x0 is the same as x0 prime minus x0. And the same thing, but with the 1. So, and this is the same as x0 prime, x1 prime minus x0, x1. So let's substitute and see what happens. Let's move this term to the right hand side of the equation. But if we factor out the vector x0, x1, then you can write the above expression as this. Let's call this matrix B. And then we can simplify our notation, writing symbolically x prime equals 1 plus epsilon B times x, where this one is uh, an identity, of course. And remember, x prime is defined by x0 prime, x1 prime, and of course, x equals x0, x1. And b, of course, 0, 1, 1, 0. Now, suppose you want to perform n times a transformation, a di this transformation, with with each epsilon equals a certain parameter eta over capital N, with N very, very large, so that we can continue to say that epsilon is an infinitesimal number, of course. The first transformation will be eta over N times B acting on the vector x. And we want to transform applying the same matrix, and so on. So we finally have n transformations to obtain x prime. Or equivalently, x prime equals 1 plus eta b over n to the power of n times x. If we check the limit, when n goes to infinity, you know perfectly what the limit is because uh, this is the well-known exponential definition. So you finally obtain that x prime can be expressed by means of an exponential of eta b acting on x. Santi told me that some of you have already seen what a Lie group is and others not because you haven't studied advanced mathematical methods. That's why I'm doing this, because the same idea is what you should use to get an exponential from a generator. Let's expand this exponential. As you know perfectly, this is the Taylor expansion. 1 plus the exponent eta b plus 1 over 2 eta square, the matrix square, plus 1 3, sorry, 3 factorial, eta 3, the matrix to the power of 3, and so on. But it turns out that this generator square is 1 in this case. So you can write 1 plus eta plus 1 half eta square, the identity plus, and look at this, this is this is nothing more than 
b itself. So we can write 1 over 3 factorial n to the power of 3 times b. The next term will be 1 over 4 factorial eta 4 times the identity and so on. You can now factor out the identity 1 plus 1 half eta squared plus 1 over 4 factorial n to the power of 4 and so on plus we factor out matrix B times eta plus 1 over 3 factorial eta to the power of 3 plus blah 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 but this is a hyperbolic cosine of eta times the identity plus b, the matrix b, times hyperbolic sine of eta. And if we write it as a matrix, then you have hyperbolic cosine in the diagonal terms of the matrix and in the off diagonal you have hyperbolic sine. So x0 prime and x1 prime, returning to the original notation, is this matrix times the original vector. And this is Lorentz transformation as a function of the parameter eta. But what is eta? One way to see this is writing ct prime equals hyperbolic cosine times ZT plus hyperbolic sine of eta x, x prime equals hyperbolic sine of eta CT plus hyperbolic cosine eta x. If you divide these two equations, the second divided by the first, you have this divided by this. If you divide by ct, you obtain 1 over c, x over t, hyperbolic cosine plus hyperbolic sine, 1 over c, x over t. If you divide the whole expression by cosine, hyperbolic cosine, then you have 1 and 1, and this is hyperbolic tangent. Let's multiply the whole equation by c. So we have a c here, and this c cancels out. But if you solve the equation of motion of a free particle, you know then that x equals vt, and this must be valid for any inertial frame then you can write that the equation of motion, it will have the same form. So this is v prime and this is v. The velocity of a particle seen in a reference relating with a velocity seen in other inertial frame. Let's write nicer. But we still have to know what eta is. So we can perform a limit. Suppose the particle velocity is smaller than c, and knowing that tangent eta takes values between minus 1 and 1, then if you take the limit, so v prime equals almost equal to v plus something. But now we are in a regime where the Galilean transformations are valid. And we know that the term that it's summing here is the relative velocity between the two inertial frames. So there it is. Rewriting the formula, we have a capital B here. So hyperbolic tangent of eta is the relative velocity between the inertial frames over C. So remembering that hyperbolic cosine square minus hyperbolic sine square is 1, dividing 
the whole equation by hyperbolic cosine squared, then you obtain this equation. And if we isolate the hyper hyperbolic cosine, we will have 1 over square root 1 minus tangent square. So if you substitute, you obtain the well-known Lorentz factor. So hyperbolic sine square equals, so you have 1 over 1 minus b square c square minus 1, and summing, we obtain this. So rewriting the transformation as a function of capital B, it is, you can factor out the square root. And so much for the class. Today's objective was, on the one hand, not to advance in material, on the other hand, to deduce a Lorentz transformation from a relativistic action, and last but not least, to show you uh, a Lie group in action. So, see you soon. Bye.